All right, everyone, welcome. We'll just give it one more minute for people to join. Hope you're all doing well and uh, great to see you. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second section se session of the Tribal Early Learning Initiative, Tele Collaborative. We're really excited to be with you for our first kind of official Tele Collaborative only uh, call. Um, I'm Moshmi Veltengedi. I'm the Director of Tribal Early Childhood at the Administration for Children and Families in the Office of Early Childhood Development and uh, the Program Manager for the Tele. Um, very pleased to be with you today. A few logistical items as we get started. We are recording this webinar for future reference and a copy of the slides for the webinar and the recording will be available um, following the webinar on the Tribal Child Care Capacity Building Center website. And then of course, as we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to place those in the chat box so we can follow up with you. You will have an opportunity to interact with our speaker as well by coming off of mute if you would like to do that. So thank you again for being here. We don't have time for introductions of everyone, but it would be great if everyone could please share in the chat box your name, your tribal or organizational affiliation, your role in the telly, and your favorite and least favorite household chore, just as a quick icebreaker. I look forward to seeing what you all share in the chat. All right, next slide. All right. Today we will be starting with our guest speaker, Dr. Jessica Ulrich, and we're really excited to have her join us today. She will talk with us about the Indigenous Connectedness Framework and its importance in early childhood development for about half an hour. And then following her presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes for her with her to ask questions and have some discussion. Then we'll move into breakout groups and reflect on how the framework can apply to our work in tele. Um, folks will have an opportunity to share your progress so far. And then finally, we will discuss some strategies for meeting as teams in your communities. All right, and now I'm really pleased and honored to be able to introduce you to Dr. Jessica Senegok Ulrich. She is an amazing um, uh, Alaska Native scholar and just a wonderful advocate for children and families. And there's so many wonderful things I could share about her with you, but I'm gonna let her share in her way with you. And so I will ask you to please join me in welcoming our guest, Dr. Jessica Ulrich. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. And so nice to um, meet all of you virtually and in th the chat. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful to be with you all and for the work that you do. And I'll be sharing with you what I'm learning about connectedness and this concept and where where the journey began and, and what um, I'm continuing to learn now with all of you and with um, my community and in multiple spaces. So I'm really excited to uh, connect with you all today. And a little bit more about my background um, in terms of who I am and where I come from. So uh, my family is originally from Wales, Alaska. So this is a picture of our mountain. It's right next to the ocean. It's the westernmost tip of the United States, closest to um, the Diomede Islands in Siberia. And then this is a picture of um, my dance group, who I consider my family in many ways. The, these are my daughters when they were younger. Um, this is a picture of my great-grandmother, uh, Helen Aklasiak Sanungatuk. This is my grandmother, Nancy Felton, um, who I'm named after. Sunny Guck was her new back name. Uh, this is my mom. Everyone called her Punky. That was her nickname in Nome, Alaska, where she grew up. 
And then this is myself and my little sister. Um, when I was around six years old, I grew up primarily in Anchorage and Wasilla, but I would travel back to Nome for family time in the summer. Um, I've been to Wales with my dance group. I've attended dance festivals there. And then this is my partner in life. Um, and I'm currently living in Spokane, Washington, while he goes to law school at Gonzaga University. So what an adventure this life is. And I'm sure uh, many of you can relate. Uh, but I want to set a, an intention for this time in this presentation. I always feel like that's so important to do. Um, and uh, this is a picture of my girls when they're much younger again. They're now teenagers. I'm a, a mother of two teenage daughters now, but um, I love this picture because of the joy and the light and the love that I, I feel um, as I look at this. And so I really want to kick off this webinar in a good way. Um, I'm so honored again to be part of your network. All of you that are doing the good work with our young children, we do this for the love of our children. So I'm hoping that what I share uh, continues to, you know, spark the, the fire, um, the, the good work, um, and gives us a seed or a dose of good medicine as we continue to, to learn and grow and shift and um, challenge some of the systemic um, harms that have happened through various modalities. So it's for the love. It's about love. It's not about fear and competition or have, you know, continuing to operate in silos, but looking at how we can be brave and bold and courageous and um, tap into an energy source within that is sustainable, that won't burn us out, that will continue to keep us going and um, motivated to do the good work. And that's always been my guiding light. I worked in child welfare before I, going back to school for my PhD. Um, now I'm looking at the education system and just recently was uh, informed I have a grant to look at transforming the education system in the Bering Strait region. So I'm like super excited about um, applying this knowledge and bringing it to the work in a good way. And I feel like it's this love, it's because of this love for our children, our sacred children, that all of these um, opportunities are continuing to just synchronistically work out. So I'm very grateful for that. And I'm sharing with you what I've been learning through research. Um, I'm a, an assistant professor at Washington State University in the iReach program now. I was previously at University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, but I've done multiple projects now and it's always with community and it's that relationship with community, that understanding that our community has their own internal PhDs, so to speak. <laughs> Maybe they didn't go through the official like school process, but we have such amazing elders and knowledge bearers and wisdom keepers within our communities that can help us do the best we can um, to do the work in a good way. And so I'm grateful for these two community organizations that helped me with my dissertation research, where I first started to talk to people and ask um, what their thoughts were about what promotes child well being and kind of learning from literature review processes about connectedness and sort of comparing what I was hearing through their stories with what I was reading in the literature about connectedness. So uh, Facing Foster Care in Alaska and Alaska Center for Resource Families, they help me every step of the way. Um, and I I'm, have deep gratitude for their partnership. And as I engaged in the research, I listened to those with lived experience of the Alaska child welfare system um, with who ident self-identified as Alaska Native who were over 18. And um, I talked to nine foster care alumni, 10 relative caregivers, six um, foster parents. And I was just, again, focused on learning about what they felt promoted child well-being. And this is a map on the right-hand side that shows the different regions that the people, where they were from, like where they had tribal affiliation. 
Um, I met with people face to face, whether it was in person or through like Zoom or like um, Skype. I know I use Skype a couple times. So it's always video conferencing so I could see people at least as we talked. Um, and I engaged in a process of storytelling and story listening. And, and part of what I'm sharing with you is the co-storing process where they shared their story. I, I bring my story, my life experience to this as well. And I'm now sharing it with all of you. And that's what I have come to understand to be a relational knowledge exchange. And there's something sacred that happens when we engage in that process. And it, it's where the process is as important as the outcomes, the way we do this, the way we come together and gather and relate with one another and learn from each other is healing. It's, it's what I'm hearing more and more indigenous research, it's that ceremony process. And that's definitely what happened um, as I engaged in that research. And it was healing for both of us. So the person sharing their story, but also for the person listening, me especially, like it was so powerful and amazing. And and from that storytelling process, I, of course, analyzed the data and was, you know, coding things and looking for common themes and um, concepts and those kind of things. But then there's this part where you step back and you're like, okay, what is it that all of these stories are teaching us? What are the important lessons to be learned? It's that bigger picture view that I feel like in um, many indigenous storytelling sort of uh, knowledge exchange processes, there's that aha moment, things click. It's like, oh, <laughs> and then every time you hear the same story, sometimes it's a different lesson that you learn. But these are some of the lessons that I learned from the knowledge bearers that I spoke with. And one of them is that we must acknowledge the trauma, the disconnect, the relational wounding that has happened. So even though I was set out only asking questions about child well-being, it was difficult for people to do that without putting it in context of the healing that they had to go through or that they were supporting a child with um, in order to explain what well-being meant to them. Because Many of us, we don't get through life unscathed, and then we're living in a society where there's a whole lot of harm mm -hmm. that has happened, um, oppressive harm, systemic harm, colonial harm that has happened that we're still kind of resisting and what we're up against. And so this process of really acknowledging that is, is an important piece of really getting at uh, what it is that can help our children and our, our community achieve well-being once more. Another lesson that was learned was that we need to maintain relational continuity, that relational connectedness, um, in order to promote child well-being. So again, there are many systems, child welfare specifically, where it's a norm to disconnect children from their family and from their parents and from their siblings and from their communities, their schools, their neighborhoods, their the place that um, maybe their ancestors, their ancestral homelands, those kind of things are still happening within that system. And if there is intervention, I, you know, one of the lessons I learned was we have to do more and do better to ensure that the relational con continuity and connectedness remains no matter what. And that needs to be really a focal point in order to help a child feel like they are safe and that they do belong and that they are well. Um, and I know they're in multiple systems. I don't think it's an intentional practice or a policy to disconnect and, you know, cause harm, but it is sometimes a consequence where our best intentions um, may cause further harm or compound the trauma rather than alleviating it. So relational continuity, this is what builds and maintains those connectedness relationships for our young ones. And we teach them that from a very young age. And the way that we as indigenous people and indigenous communities, the way that we do that, it's culturally based. 
but it's important to do. And our and this is where our elders instructed us to teach our young ones to know who they are and where they come from. There's a reason why they gave those instructions. Um, and I'll get back to that in just a bit. But one of the relationships that is really important to um, help a child build and um, sustain is connectedness with the earth. And our children, I feel like they have a natural propensity to do that. Like my children, when they were younger, if we were next to water, they were not going to keep their, <laughs> their shoes and socks or boots on for very long. <laughs> they were taking them off and walking around barefoot. It didn't matter how cold it was. <laughs> so, you know, I feel like we observe, if we stand back and observe our children, they they naturally want that connection with the land and with the air and with the water um, and with the animals and the plants and those sorts of things. And it's our responsibility to help teach them how to be in right relationship with the earth. And then same for intergenerational connectedness that children, they this is a picture here of every time I saw an elder get up and dance, there's a little one, a toddler typically that was getting up and dancing right next to them. It was like a, a natural thing that happened. Um, so we want to help build that and sustain it and help our young ones continue to connect with the elders um, and connect with um you know, knowing their history and who who their elders and ancestors are and, and to help them understand who they are. And, and to know that who they are is a future ancestor, their future generations counting on us. So we have teachings and stories and those kind of processes that help teach us, but we need to make sure that it's brought back to the centerfold because I feel like in some systems like education, oftentimes, this is not talked about. Uh, I can't believe how many times when I taught um, college level classes and we're talking about the history of indigenous people, they don't know that history. So um, we're still needing to work and advocate for change in order to make sure this is still continued. <clears throat> and then in terms of community, we need to help our children build uh, connectedness with the community. And we do that by bringing them with us to everything, right? To all the gatherings, the community events. Um, that's where we can help sustain that for, for our young ones. They're always watching us. So this is a picture where we're at like a rally and it's all about defend the sacred and environmental justice stuff, but they're watching us and they're learning from us and they're observing us. And so we want to make sure that what we do, how we do it, we're role modeling for them how to be strong and healthy and to understand there's a responsibility we have to our, our collective, that what we do affects a collective. And we do that based on different indigenous values that we may have. Um, and that's part of the community's responsibilities to teach that to our young ones. And then family connectedness is another important relationship for children to build and maintain, not just with the nuclear family or a parent-child dyad, but like in our, our ways, I'm learning, um, it was like the whole community was a family. You know, it's who we make to be a family. Uh, it, it's biological, but it's also by marriage or just by adoption or all the different processes. Um, and we help children understand who their family is and, and how they belong. And, and a family provides us with roles and responsibilities as well. So in generational roles and responsibilities, there's so much that the family does um, to help a child know who they are, where they come from. And then um, this one is like the all encompassing what makes everything possible in terms of our, our life, our, our, you know, our worldview, everything is based on culture and spirit. Um, and spirit, I, when I studied the literature, I saw it as being a term that really overlapped with what is now called culture. Um, so culture is a more recent term. It's um, anthropological. It's uh, 
it's kind of describing a way of life and a way of being, but our spirit and spirituality, our indigenous ways of knowing and being, it's it it's the same kind of thing. So like the ceremonies, um, the traditions, the names, um, the food, the uh all the practices that we we have, you know, the dancing and singing, all of that, it's someone could call it cultural, but for us, it was very much spiritual. So um, they're overlapping terms, but how important it is that we're helping our children understand who they are as a spiritual and cultural being. So the last lesson, the third lesson that I really stepped back and, and came to understand from the research was this element of knowing who you are and where you come from and what that means, why our elders have instructed us to, to learn that for ourselves and to teach the younger generations is it helps us be in right relationship with ourselves to know who we are beyond the social constructs, beyond the limitations, um, to know who we are as, you know, a spiritual being. I'm, I am limitless, timeless. I'm love. I'm light. I'm spirit. I'm connected with God, creator, everything. Like I, I am my family. I am my community. I am um, who I am is very powerful in a good way, not in an oppressive way, but in a, a loving um, I'm here for a reason kind of way. And that's what we want to instill in our young ones. That's what we want them to grow up knowing and being anchored in and, you know, grounded in that so that they can fly, so that they can dream and vision and um, apply their gifts in our community in the way that we uh, can just uh, enjoy and appreciate what they bring. So... This concept of um, knowing who you are, where you come from, it came up several times in the interviews. And this is a, a short quote um, where she was saying, this was a foster care alumni and all these names um, are alternate names they selected for themselves. But she said, the importance for me is to know where I came from and to know who I am and just being me because in this world without my culture, without my language and without the stuff I know, I feel lost. Who am I? Was I supposed to be someone different? Then I should learn those things. And it's just really important to me to know that stuff so I can pass it down to my children because it's who we are. And it's really important to have with us. So those quotes came up over and over and over again in terms of what it is that promotes child well being, um, what well being means to people is knowing who you are as an individual, as a unique being, but that understanding that you're connected to a collective, that you're connected to a beautiful earth, to an amazing community, to strong, powerful, loving ancestors, um, to a family that has, is with you through thick and thin, you know, like that connectedness is the interrelated um, well-being of all. And so it's all about relationship. So I created this connectedness framework um, to help create a visual to sort of capture all of the knowledge and information in the best way I could. And this visual, uh, the symbol, I at the time I was writing and um, trying to explain what I'm understanding to be connectedness, I looked at a, a book in a library of Native art, and the symbol was on some of the sacred ceremonial like um, tusks, it was carved into tusks and those kind of things. And I kept seeing it in the Anupak and Yupik art. And I was like, okay, I think this will work. This is gonna help me. Um, and then I learned from one of my colleagues, Elsie Boudreau, that this symbol in the Yupik culture uh, represents the eye of awareness. So I just felt like, yeah, <laughs> it really does apply. So let me explain this visual a little bit. The words in the red are representing that acknowledgement of the trauma and challenges that people brought up and what they shared and what they observed. And um, this is that acknowledgement where we want to pre prevent those from becoming 
relational disconnects, like mechanisms of relational disconnect and separation. We, we don't want those traumas to become an ongoing um, challenge for people. What we want to do, it's not to say that those things don't exist and that, yes, we all go through trauma and challenges, but we want to outweigh them with the strength, the, the wisdom of our ancestors that taught us how to build and maintain connectedness relationships through our dancing, our singing, our naming ceremonies, you know, through what, how we express respect for one another, how we um, build in stability as much as possible, even though there's a lot of change in every year, seasons change and everything, but we still can count on that. Um, so we want to teach and, and build um, relationships and, and help maintain that connectedness despite all of these um, challenges out here. And what that does is it helps promote the internal connectedness piece. So when I'm in, when I have healthy relationships with you all and with my family and with the environment and all of these things, it helps me internally feel good about who I am and who I'm connected to and like um, that I'm unique and I belong and uh, all of these things in here that I'm safe, um, that you know, there's a sense of self-worth, all of those things. And that's where I'm explaining, like, this is the knowing who you are, where you come from, is it helps us learn how to be relational human beings. So real human beings, a lot of our terms for how we call our tribal communities and groups, ethnic groups up in Alaska, like Anupak, that translates to the real human being. And I'm like, oh, maybe they're saying, you know, what a real human being is, is to be relational. It's to be connected. So I'm still learning more. <laughs> and I'm going to write a paper. It's due April 1st <laughs> for the Family Justice Journal. I'm writing a paper on internal connectedness right now where I'm trying to explain and go a little bit deeper into what that means. But it it really, I feel like there are parallels to the medicine wheel and like Terry Cross's relational worldview, where there's, you know, internally mind, body, spirit, but there's relationships that we develop <laughs> internally with, with our mind and with our body and with our spirit and with our emotions. Um, and if we learn how to be in right relationship with ourselves, I feel like that's what will help promote the relational well-being of all. Of, and that's how important child well-being is. If we promote the well-being of a single child, you're promoting the well-being of their family, their community, their future generations, their ancestors, and the earth. Like that's how sacred and important each child is. So we we teach that. All of these sorts of things teach that and so our languages are important that's like that cuts across all domains it helps in all ways how to be um how to develop healthy relationships but all of these different things are ways that we can uh, really be intentional about how we're teaching our children that and we want them to know they're connected to a collective and i feel like they do know that <laughs> But we need to stop our systems from like kind of training that out of them. Um, and I think there's a values clash that happens within many of our systems where there's a forgetting almost that we're connected to a collective um, and that working together and sharing and cooperating and those kind of values are as important or more important than some of the values of, you know, individualism and competition and, um, you know, feeling like there's a, a deficit mentality uh, oftentimes. But this was a picture up in Wales. They, these three were from Wales, the community, and they got up and were dancing for King Island. We're bringing our songs and dances back after they are dormant for, um, 50 years due to missionaries saying it was evil and bad. So that's part of what we're up against. We're still bringing it back. We're reconnecting. We're repairing 
And we do have to acknowledge the history again and what our ancestors have been through. So this is a, out of a page of Harold Napoleon's book, you, 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 uh, the way of the human being. Um, and I love this article by Sean Ginwright on healing centered engagement, because he's saying in this paragraph here, this young man stood up and said, I am more than what happened to me. I'm not just my trauma. So what we want to do is to help our children develop a relational identity and not a trauma identity. Um, to me, trauma, like the, we don't want our children to be victims. We don't want them to be perpetrators of harm. So that's part of why it's so important to teach how to be in right relationship. Or if there is a harm, then how to repair it, how to heal that, how to um, come back, be reminded of who they are beyond that. So that's, that's the healing work. So that's where I feel like, you know, how shall we proceed? Um, it, it, it's all of it. It's all of you. It's all of us putting in the effort to unlearn some unhealthy ways of relating, <laughs> um, to learn who we are, where we come from beyond, you know, the trauma and the challenges to acknowledge it still, but know how to be in relationship with ourselves internally and with others. And I feel like our, our cultural ways of knowing and being have so much wisdom to help us with those healing efforts. So I'm applying this right now. I'm working on a, a curriculum with my tribe. We're going to um, host gatherings where I'm teaching or we're we're teaching <laughs> um, different uh, these different concepts explaining what it is doing activities and then we're going to build in um, time for you know, just being together and beading and sewing or mask making or carving and those kind of things um, so we're getting ready to pilot it. And this is where the implementation piece is. It's not enough to just know a theory or have this knowledge. It's like, how do we apply it? How do we bring it to the curriculum? How do we bring it to our young people? How do we teach our own children? How do we engage with community in a way that we're teaching our children at the same time these important lessons? So... Thankfully, um, there's a lot of amazing work going on out there uh, in many tribal communities where they're already centering well-being in many ways. So this is like from the um, Yupik region again. They've been doing amazing things. They have a healthy families program. And then this curriculum, reteaching, we're kind of reconnecting with that ancestral knowledge. And um, there are a lot of hopes that we have in terms of um, the future and what it looks like to, you know, we're the adults learning this and, and teaching it like we, we're on our own healing journeys oftentimes. Um, I know I am. And given my family's background and history, uh, we can't ignore that. It's part of like where we can authentically come to our communities and engage in a way of that knowing and being that we're living our truth, we're living this. It's not just about, you know, some a, a, a book or some knowledge out there. It's like, that's where I feel like this research has helped, helped me so much on my healing journey. And now I'm wanting to help others continue um, and to reconnect with themselves and knowing who they are, where they come from. So we matter, it's kind of the bottom line message with that. Um, you all matter, your healing journey matters. As you help heal yourself, you're helping heal your family, community and future generations in the earth. So, and then I'll just end with this last um, slide here. And this is a painting my daughter made for me. And this was part of that journey again, like here I am learning about connectedness and I'm talking to all these amazing people and I started to feel stuff where I was like, it felt like grief or I, I don't know how to describe it all, but it was a whole lot of mix of emotions and, and, uh, 
that year when I, it was my birthday, I set an intention of healing my heart. I felt like I had a broken heart. I was like, okay, creator, it's time. I'm ready. Please help me heal my broken heart. And then that night, (laughs) after I had an amazing trip to Seward, Alaska and stepped in the water and had the sun beam right into my spirit, (laughs) um, in a really sacred moment, um, that night I get this painting for my daughter and it just felt that like that confirmation that yes, it's time and it's happening and it, I'm ready and we're all ready. Um, and it was that teaching, one of the first teachings I needed to learn in order to heal my heart was that love comes from the light inside. And now as I've learned and I continue to learn, that's where I'm like, oh, that's that's what her painting was telling me. This is a reminder of who I am and I love myself and that light is always inside of me. And that's the same for all of you. That's my hope and prayer for all of you and for our sacred children. So with that, I'd like to invite questions, (laughs) engage in some dialogue discussion. Um, But I, yeah, I thank you all for listening to me. You Eva, you're are. muted. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, just wanted to say thank you. It was such an honor to get to just be here in this presence with you and learn from you and just, um, I don't know, I've just mesmerized kind of. A, I don't know that I have a lot to say, but I would like to really open it up to all of you great collaborative folks out there who are starting this journey of trying to bring your communities together on behalf of the children, like Dr. Ulrich talked about. And um, I'd like you to either just come off mute and uh, ask some questions or or share some thoughts, or you can also put something in the chat, uh, a question specifically for Dr. Ulrich. Um, Does anybody have anything specific that they'd like to ask while we have her in our presence? Hey, Tiffany. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I muted myself and I put myself on video. I just wanted to say hi to everyone. It's good to see everyone on the, the first call. Um, Dr. Ulrich, thank you for sharing your words um, and your knowledge with us. It was very powerful and inspiring. Um, I The words that you shared really resonated with me in terms of uh, when you said learning from each other is healing. And so I think that's something that I will continue to reflect on um, through this uh, process. And as um, one of the collaborative tribes, um, so I'm looking forward to, you know, finding that energy and finding a collective energy within myself um, and also our partners. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad that um, there was some helpful information shared. And um, that's always my my hope and prayer is that it's useful, that it's um, that it helps connect with your spirit as well. That, you know, this is we all have this in us, this powerful, beautiful, loving. Um, light within (laughs) and then uh, our children sometimes are our greatest teachers and reminders of that and that's been the case with my daughters for sure um and then just looking at how do we help our little teachers you know continue to share and and learn and grow and explore and all of those things um and to stay who they are (laughs) as the beautiful spirits they are. Thank you. I'd like to 
No, go ahead. Whoever it is, please. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's Jennifer uh, with Chickasaw okay. Nation. I think sometimes it's hard to hear those messages from our children just from the way that we were raised, probably, because some of the things that I'm told sometimes I'm just like, oh, you know, and it almost takes your breath away because you hear it. So encouraging that in them and just saying, you know, um, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for, you know, being able to share that with me because sometimes it does like take you aback, like, whoa. You know, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or suggestions for us of how to take what we've learned today back and and think about the systems that we're trying to change. The, the reason that we're coming together here is to to make it easier and better for families to navigate the system, which eventually helps the children. But do you have any thoughts for us on the systemic level, level how to engage yeah. with the framework? Yeah, I think um, there's, oh man, there's so much to, to share and think about with that. So one of the things that I think so I have a social work background and, um, and I've taught in education. And um, I think sometimes in these positions that we're in, we create a separation with the families and with the community where we, we don't continue to understand and realizing, but realize that I am from this family and from this community. You know what I mean? Like we're part of the community, our systems our community systems, their relational systems. These, these systems could not operate without people inside of them doing this work. Um, and so one of the things that when I talk about systemic change, I'm talking about relational change. And relational change means that um, there's a leveling that needs to happen of power. There needs to be... Um, like, just because I have a, a PhD after my name, that does not make me smarter or better than anyone else. But I feel like in the Western view, sometimes that that sort of, I, I get handed the mic more, the doors open up and, and it's like, well, please see that the people in our communities, the families that are coming to the table, they are also knowledge bearers, wisdom keepers, you know, like, so there's a, a need for that mutual respect. There's a need for us to understand how we fit in relationally to all of this work. Um, and I feel like when we do that, when we come at it in that way with a loving heart and with an openness and respect for all, and we're listening to those with the lived experience, that that's where the solutions and, and like the creativity and the visioning work can lead to what can look different. So I'm not here to tell you how you need to do your programs. <laughs> it's a process. So I'm just sharing with you, like there's a process you can engage in to bring forward and bring out those solutions and ideas from the families and community members and the elders that can guide these efforts. So this framework, I'm hoping you fill it in with your own specific knowledge, your own context, your own cultural you know, values and um, stories and those sorts of things, your own history. Uh, but this is just to give you maybe a launching pad um, for the different areas to maybe focus some questions on or around so that you, you um, facilitate that knowledge yourselves for your own children within your own communities. I hope that makes sense. It does. Total. Total mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Anyone else? We have a precious moment here. <laughs> Eva, I just wanted to share that um, uh, in the comments, there's a lot of comments about how powerful this presentation was, how um, Brenna says sharing that we will someday be ancestors gives a very powerful perspective on our responsibility to our children and to one another as it relates to the work in Tully and moving forward with collaboration. And there are a number of similar types of comments um, that I'm seeing. So thank you all for sharing that. Anyone else want to share? Good afternoon. Uh, hello, I'm Janae Sanchez and I'm from the Pueblo of San Felipe. 
Um, and I just wanted to thank you for just all your work. Um, you know, I feel like tribes and community members are always, you know, they're, they're the bearers of so much wisdom. And, you know, sometimes we're overlooked in really, I guess the answers that we have for our own people. And I, I just, you know, really applaud that work because when you win, we all win. And I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, we're, we're all in this work together. Um, but I was just wondering if you had any, um, I guess just examples or recommendations for how to capture the qualitative like stories that your, your work has really um, just started to uncover. I know that um, community-based part participatory research is really like a hot topic within tribal communities right now. And um, I think that it can go right in so many ways, but I also think that if we're not paying attention, um, we miss a lot of those aspects um, of stories that could be captured and, and highlighted in a really positive way. So I just wonder if you could share some of your own experiences with that. Thank you. Um, that's such a good point. And, and that's where I feel like that's why indigenous research methods, it was something I had to learn on the side of my graduate school education, unfortunately, but I did center it. I, I like, I was like, no, <laughs> you're not going to make me not like do something that doesn't align with that relational way of being um, and to do it in the process being something that is healing simultaneously. So um, my recommendation is, yes, you have, you know, advisors, elders that are helping guide the, the work, the questions, the way that you connect with people. Um, and kind of checking yourself, because I think if you're doing it all alone, you, you're going to miss stuff. You're, you're not going to um, always, you know, catch like, oh, I should have thought of that. So it's like the more minds you can bring together to really be planful and, and to prepare for that research is, is an important element. So that's one piece. The other piece is um, I am... So I provided an opportunity for the knowledge bears to create their, an alternate name for themselves where I wasn't identifying them, but as they read papers I wrote or, you know, as I share quotes and presentations and stuff, if they're in the audience, I always write and everything where I'm like, they're in the audience, <laughs> they're reading this, I'm writing this for them. Um, I want them to know that's coming from them you know, but that's only what they knew. So I tried to find ways where they could still see themselves in, in the work and in the research. But now I'm like, I want to take it one step further. And I, I do want to invite people to, uh, if they are comfortable with it or want their names attached to this curriculum, for example, we're going to get um, feedback from elders and community members. Do they want to have their name attached to um, the curriculum? you know, so that there's that acknowledgement piece that's so important that I feel like it's bypassed sometimes. And then the last thing I'll say in terms of um, research and qualitative is like, um, really, uh, there's so much more I could say about that. But um, I feel like when we do it well, it, it's, it's something that is always coming from that place of love, being very mindful of this is powerful to share story like this. Um, there's a responsibility with that. And uh, to make sure we, we don't exploit or sugarcoat things or, you know, do anything like that, but like um, how we share the dissemination piece is as important. And that's where I feel like communities, they get frustrated and they feel like, here you come in, you do all this research and we never hear from you again. Mm. You know, so it's like always making sure you're giving it back in, in real time, like as you're gathering it, but also like more than once um, and staying connected with the community is, is so important. So I hope that helps answer some of that question, but there's a whole lot of, that could be a whole <laughs> graduate, you know, focus on, um, that could be a dissertation, you know, <laughs> but thank you so much for asking that. Thank you. Any other final thoughts for Dr. Ulrich? 
before she goes back like to, to <laughs> go ahead go ahead um, please I was very um, appreciative of how you talked about the inter intergenerational teaching because you know that a teaching can come from like you said a, a young you know child they do it I think that's what I find very passionate about us being teachers or just mm -hmm. in that early childhood feel is that they are spontaneous and they kind of remind us of what we should actually we're seen as those role models that you mentioned but in reverse sometimes they're those role models for us you know they're very resilient to what's going on around them and it's like they will adapt as they're going through each day and what I highly liked about that is that when they're fully immersed in their culture or like their customs it's like their their potential to gain knowledge is limitless it's just mm -hmm. Like it's a quick, like, oh my God, boom, boom, boom. And it's very, um, I always feel honored when I see that process happening just with any child, because it's like you are fostering who they are and that, you know, it is a reminder of where they come from. So I do want to thank you for sharing that. You know, that's always been a big part of me is that I can learn as much as from my elders, as much, you know, down to a, an infant, you know, you're kind of relearning where you come from your roots. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And what you just shared, um, I just, it reminded me to, I wanted to um, mention to all of you too, what I learned at a symposium I was at last week, but also in reflection to the young ones is this element of care and how important it is that we practice self-care, but to understand self-care is community care. And so I was thinking about our young ones and how when they're real little, and if someone gets hurt and they fall down, they like flock and they're helping and they're, you know, hugging and, you know, I just have seen that so many times where they just come in and they're like with them and helping and loving up that one that got hurt. Um, but the young one that got hurt, they're receiving. So that element of being open to receiving that care. Um, and not being embarrassed or ashamed, but to allowing yourself to be supported. I, I feel like our young ones, they do this. <laughs> so let's learn from them. So yeah, thank you so much. That gave me a good reminder of that, but that, that intergenerational teaching for sure happens. Well, one final thank you. Um, it was it was great. We're going to uh, go back now and talk about this some more within our small groups. But I just wanted to say that it's I feel it's so important you were with us and your words were with us in the beginning of our collaboratives. We're kind of just starting our journeys, just putting our teams together at the local community. And we as we've designed Tele, we have been really intentional about this first few months being about relationships. You know, we want to jump in and, and do a project. Let's do centralized intake forms. Let's share our data. And that all will happen. But starting with building these relationships with ourselves, with each other, all of our team members, to us has been so important that we get that foundational work done before we jump into our project. So you've launched us with your words of wisdom. And I just wanted to thank you one more time. You're very welcome. And I'll put in the chat before I go um, my email in case anyone has follow up questions or want to connect further. Um, I am available. So, Quay all right. to all of you. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Okay. Now we're going to do a little more talking about this. Um, we're gonna break into some small groups. There will be two of you, two collaboratives together in each room. And we wanna explore a little bit more, uh, go a little deeper with, with Dr. Ulrich's wisdom. And we'll be looking at these three, word, the, these three questions. So how does the indigenous connectedness framework vision for supporting the healthy development of native children resonate with your team? How does it fit? with what you're trying to do. Uh, how do you think the framework could guide and inform your tele work? Because we're right in the beginning here. So what, what tidbit did you get from what she was saying that will help you as you start to 
go down the the road of your your um of your tele collaborative and how could storytelling play a role in your tele efforts you'll hear a lot from us over the next few months about storytelling and how we can incorporate that so what's going to happen is these um questions will stay up on the screen but we're going to divide you into four groups and Teresa is going to help us with that she will in just a minute she will just magically put us in our rooms and we hope you will select somebody in your group to be able to tell your story of what you talked about in these groups we'll have about 10 minutes or so um and, and there'll be one of us in there if you need any help, but this is really your time to get to know each other uh, as peers. Uh, we'll switch all of this around each time so everybody gets to spend time with each other as we move along. But um, you will automatically be put in this in your room. And let me just double check. Um, Eva, can uh, I say that the um, participants will need to choose their room that applies to them. Um, the uh, members of our smaller group will be going automatically into the rooms, but each participant today will look at the room and the name and choose that. And as soon as you give me the okay, I will launch that and they will have that opportunity. Okay, like for instance, Chickasaw and Gila River are gonna be together. So your name will pop up and you click the button and that's where you'll go or Teresa will click, click the button and that's where you'll go. So we have about 10 minutes for this. So I hope you enjoy this time and really get to spend some time with your peers. All right, Teresa, here we go. So if you haven't yet, you can see down at the bottom, it says join a breakout room. Go ahead and click that and then click the breakout room that is appropriate to you. And the questions are in the chat. So you'll have access to those still. We'll see you there.
If you're not in um, one of the breakout rooms and you would like to go in and you're having any difficulty, if you just message me and chat as to what room you would like to go into, I can help you join.
All righty. So we're all back from these small groups. Um, did, does anyone from any of the specific breakout groups want to share what you talked about or something that, that came up you hadn't thought about before? Do we have anybody that just wants to jump right in and, and share? We'll give you the opportunity to volunteer. Eva, this is Fran with San Felipe. Hi, Fran. In, in our group, uh, we just did introductions, so we didn't get very far. <laughs> That's okay. You have a big group. You have a big yes. group. Okay. okay. All right. Well, you can Ten minutes is not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> not enough time. Okay. Well, Tiffany, what, what did you learn from, from being in that small group? Um, it was really nice to see our neighbors um, and connect with some familiar faces. Um, I know I've been working closely with Fran and um, we've been on a call with Janae, um, but seeing more of their team members um, and knowing that I went to high school with some of them or connected <laughs> with them through social media, I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah. it, it was just nice to, to see that and know that, you know, um, there's many of us that are looking to, you know, to this um, tele-collaborative, um, you know, for the benefit of the community. And one of the things that crossed my mind at the end, being that we didn't even get to touch on those uh, questions was, um, can San Felipe and uh, Santo Domingo come together on a separate call and, you know, kind of share and answer those questions? Um, because I know that San Felipe received um, the collaborative before, and it looked, to me, it looks like they benefited in terms of, you know, how far they've come, but also looking and seeing that, you know, they still need more um, guidance and support in order to reach their goals. And so um, San Domingo Pueblo is, you know, just starting out and trying to uh, break those silos and, you know, bridge and build those relationships with one another. So um, I don't, I don't want to put, um, San Felipe on the spot or create any expectations, but I do hope that we can learn from them as well. And I just know you will and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> they will learn, learn from you as well. Tiffany, we can do better. We can come together in person and share. That'd be have like a nice that. session. There you go, like have a meeting. <laughs> You're very close to each other, right? Geographically? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I've what about our group? Oh, that close. <laughs> That's <laughs> really close. <laughs> uh, what Eva, about our, our like, Oh, go Eva, ahead. Hi, Lisa. it's Lisa. Uh -huh. And I was hi. just going to say that I had joined that group. And I also just used that as the opportunity um, to express how excited that we are to be coming on site next week with um, some of our federal partners. Um, so we wanted to take an opportunity to meet you know, with, with our um, various um, program directors. Um, it's also an opportunity for them to share their thoughts or highlight their programs, share challenges um, during, you know, both while we're there in person, as well as through the listening conference or the listening session. Um, so I think it's just going to be um, a very exciting visit for all of us next week. And um, so we're looking forward to, to seeing one, if not all of the folks that had joined in that group. Um, no, that'll be great. Like one of those different opportunities. So um, I'll be joining Joey as well as our um, Office of Child Care um, Director, Dr. Friedman. Great. We'll see the entire program. They have yes. they have Very almost exciting. I guess they have all the programs, tribal home visiting and mm -hmm. and Head Start and child care and um, telly. So yeah, you'll get to meet a lot of people. I'm jealous. I wish I could go. <laughs> all right. What about folks from uh, Seneca? Seneca and Umatilla. You guys, did you have a chance to get to know each other? We did. It was a good little session. It was a quick introduction and we hammered through, I think, a, a good chunk of the questions. Um, we had a lot of the similar teams built and a lot of the similar um, mind work on how the connectedness supports, um, you know, the Native children here. Um, we talked a lot about the storytelling and how we use the storytelling differently. We're actually sending a couple of our teaching staff to a storytelling training 
and we're going to implement yeah when they come back um it's at the end of the month it's an indigenous storytelling training um when they come back they'll be used in all of the classrooms but we're also doing some parent education nights and some open community nights and our hope is to use the storytelling training to um kind of unify our community and do some indigenous storytelling to not just our native community but our entire community that we work with and we're hoping that the excitement of that will kind of bring bring everybody together a little bit around here. Great. Thank you. Does anybody who was on the in the Chickasaw room want to add anything? They're very new and getting their team together and all of that. Well, I could just say that they we talk about storytelling and the importance of that and how uh, effective it is to listen to stories. And we heard about one young lady <clears throat> who is raising two children by herself and, and part of her way of taking care of herself was through an app called iWay. I believe that's I, iWay, is that right? I hope that's right. Um, but talk some about that. So. Just anybody else have any uh, thing they'd like to share from from that experience? Okay, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, no, I'm going to do it. I forgot. I'm not turning it over. We're going to go to the next slide and talk about uh, engaging community partners because that's you know you all are at different stages. Some have had meetings, some haven't. But we're really wanting to learn from you more. We've, we were able to talk with you guys on the phone or through Zoom recently, but we'd like to know a little bit more about your core uh, tele team and who you think you might engage as, as part of the team. And we want to do this with the ideas board. Uh, you've done this before. We did it in our, our previous um, launch session. And so we have three questions that we would like you to think about. Who is part of your core tele team? And what is uh, that person, each person's role? Have you had your first tele team meeting? And what what did you learn from that? If you haven't met yet, what's your plan for doing so? How might you use that meeting time? And if you click on the little green button that you can see there, it will give you a little sticky. So many of you have done this before. But then you can just write whatever you'd like to, and it will show up on the board, and we'll collect all of these and I learn from you where you are with your um, with your teams. So, okay, could we send the link again? Thanks, Kate. I don't think you can click on the the what's being added in the chat. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, she's gonna try again. <laughs> try okay. Let's try again. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try that one. See if that gets you into it. And I'm thinking even maybe what we could do, that one worked great. So maybe oh, as you're all, yeah, as you're sharing this, we'll keep going just in the interest of time. And then maybe we can bring this back up and take a look at it before we end our webinar today. Oh, well, that's a good idea too. So has anybody been able to get in that they can write on the sticky? I'm not okay. seeing it on the screen. I saw a comment that somebody got in. They're You're in. in. in right. Okay. Great. Now, I, right. I can, uh, maybe Teresa I Teresa can bring it back up. There you go, Teresa. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, so maybe we can you. look at that at the yeah. end. I have awesome. to get closer. Any chance you can make it bigger, Teresa, or not? Is this it? I need to get my other glasses, I guess, huh? Oh, great. Thank you.
So we've got some folks meeting on March 22nd and using the suggest forms, that's great. These are all anonymous, obviously. Well, Kimber, I think like you said, we may need to move along as far as our time. So uh, I'll just hand it over to you and you can take us from here. That'd be that okay with good. you? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll we'll go back and, and look at this idea board again. And, and if you want to still continue putting any stickies up, uh, but we'll, we'll capture this and give you another opportunity if you need it, okay? That sounds great. Thank you. And we'll send you this too, so that you've got the entire board in case anybody continues to work on it after the webinar is over as well. So Teresa, could we go to slide 37? And let's talk. Um, yeah, great. So we just wanted to mention there that we are going to share with you some additional tools for facilitation when we meet um, in an upcoming webinar. But here we really want to share with you um, and, and just as we get ready to end in this next 10 minutes to really think about the um, importance of building relationships among your team members. Really, this is going to be um, your first and most important task that you'll face in the next three years together. Um, your community team is the foundation of your work. And I think this really builds on at least what I heard in the um, group that I was in with BBNA and Kinaitzi, that um, this importance of relationship and storytelling that um, Dr. Ulrich really talked to us about, the community team and the relationships you build in that core team and in your larger tele team, that is so important. And, you know, it, it's normal to expect disagreements, difficult conversations, differences of opinion, things you may have to work through. But these, the way you do that will determine the success of your community initiative. And it will influence the way that early childhood learning takes place in your community. So, one thing that you could do in your next tele meeting as you meet together in your own communities is to think about identifying team expectations, norms, values really early on in your process. That can help you to draw those out and to regroup, to lean on each other and on those values um, if things do go off track. The image on the screen um, that you saw was an example um, from the St. Paul Aleut community in Alaska. They developed that um, in one of their team processes. And you can see that they chose, very intentionally chose words around tradition and culture, um, not just words, but also visual examples of that, things that were very important in their culture values to help them in, maintain motivation and give them strength to work through things when there may be internal conflict in the team. Now, as you begin to list your values and group behavioral expectations, your norms and your values might look different than this slide or the one that you saw that um, St. Paul created. But we really encourage you to take the time here to develop those relationships, to get to know one another through the development of your core team values, your shared culture, your traditions, your language, all of that may play a part in the development of your core values of the Tully team. So some key questions that you might think through as you begin this are, um, why are you here? Why did you come to the table? Why are you individually, personally participating in the Tully team? And what do you hope to renew to create, revitalize, or experience as an individual on this team. What, um, how will you do this if, if things become difficult in the team? And then setting expectations for how you'll, your team will work through these things will create a strong foundation from which to jump into your community initiatives. I really love the um, image that I saw in 
my head when Dr. Ulrich described a child falling down and the community coming to the child to give hugs and encouragement and and made me think of these two slides and how you could create that as um, a part of your cultural, you know, in your culture in the team, if that was something that was important to you. So you might think about inviting elders or knowledge bearers into this process. And then as we begin to transition and um, in the last few minutes that we have together, let's think about some meeting logistics. This is something that you might want to do in one of your upcoming team meetings as well. Um, it could include who your team members are. You might know already who, who your team is, or there may be certain people that you want to invite either by name or maybe by role. Um, if you want to draw certain people or certain roles into your team for specific functions, consider developing a core group of committed individuals. And then that group can meet um, together and think about who else you might want to pull in. You might also want to decide when you'll meet, where you'll meet, how often you'll meet, who's bringing snacks, who's going to bring the music. Um, you know, if you're going to meet in person, who will share the responsibilities of leadership and other important considerations. Decision making can be stressful. It can be frustrating. So if you decide ahead of time who some of the leads will be on certain functions within the team, that can help to relieve stress and disagreements. And you might also want to think about how you'll include your um, leadership, your tribal leadership into this process. And the earlier um, and more inclusively they are a part of the process, the more smooth it may go. So we have reviewed a lot of different tools today. And in, in addition to discussing the Indigenous um, Connectedness Framework, we've talked about um, some values, we've talked about um, these logistics. Let's talk a little bit about what you might do in the next few weeks to bring this home, to, um, to really gather this information together in a team meeting, to think about what are your specific next steps. And I'd love to invite you to either put in the chat or open up the mic and let me know what you might be thinking about doing in the next few weeks as you start this, this process. I know some of you put some of that into the idea board, but um, let us know now, what will you do to maintain motivation and to get together? Anyone have? A um, this is Fran with San Felipe. Um, we are having our second um, tele team meeting on Thursday. And I guess just as far as motivation for our team, I think we want to make it fun and something that our team will want to come to. So um, the first meeting, we kind of just uh, talked about what tele was and what um, the different I guess, meetings and things that will take place and how much time it's going to take from each of our, our busy schedules. But I guess at the same time, we're looking at wanting to make sure that this meeting is something that we all want to come to and have it be something fun. So I know that at the next meeting, one of the suggestions was to create vision boards. And so that was something that we're wanting to do um, for our next meeting. Great. That is amazing. And actually, research shows that you um, not just are more, more motivated, but you actually learn quicker and you retain the learning that you have gained when you're having fun. So anything you can do to make it novel, interesting, or fun, those actually help to um, engage that learning. So the great idea. Anyone else? Okay, well, I know we're um, right to the last minute. So um, there, as we um, think about that momentum, I want to remind you, we will be meeting again on March 28th. 
And you might consider meeting with your team between now and then to identify your team values, to strengthen your relationships, or think through some of these logistics. Um, you won't have a call with Eva or I this week or this month because of the fact that we do have two webinars this month. But you're always welcome to send an email and let us know you want us to check in with you or you'd like us to help facilitate a team meeting or if you have questions or would like a resource, send an email to Eva or I will make sure you have your um, our email as well again in the chat and then um, we hope to see you on the 28th. Does anyone have oh. any questions? Yeah. Kim Kimber. Um Anne, I'm going to put you on the spot. You put a nice piece in the chat room, and I know you've you've got certain challenges being in Alaska and lots of different uh, islands or areas to work on. Do uh, you want to give us any words of wisdom as you try to put bring all of these folks together? Because I know you're going to have a big team. Well, I wish. Um, no. <laughs> no words of wisdom. <laughs> well, you know, we've been team building out here for 20 years. And so I, I feel like I don't want to bring everybody in all at once until I'm totally clear on what we're going to do. So the plan mm -hmm. is to kind of meet with individual groups. So there'd be like, you know, the other BBNA departments. And then I would have a separate meeting with the districts that we work with. We're involved with the um, the RTC, the Rural Technical Education Program. So we would meet, you know, them with the school districts or something. And then the HSAC, you know, they have a totally different point of view. So what I plan on doing is having each of my managers kind of work with the groups that fall under their content areas. So wellness would work with the HSAC, get them all on board. And then after we get everybody all jazzed up and excited, then we can talk about bringing everybody in and Food, always have food. Always have food. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Ann. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Kimber, last words or whatever. Thank you uh, uh, so much. Is, yeah, absolutely. If you didn't get to share or if you have questions, feel free to contact us. And we're excited to see you on the 28th. Bye, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.